Hello all, welcome to uh, PMTV. Um, Ned Johnson here, I'm founder and president and tutor geek at Prep Matters. Uh, delighted to spend um, a better part of an hour here with y'all talking about my favorite thing, punctuation. Um, you know, that's remarkably nerdy, but sometimes I just get enthusiastic. So if I get carried away, if I talk too fast, if something didn't make sense, you can feel free to pop a question up in the Q&A. Uh, if it seems like it's timely uh, right here and now, then I will address that. If it feels like that's a question that's better asked at the end, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about all things punctuation. So I'm gonna to try to talk about rules of punctuation in a big picture way that will apply to both the SCT and the ACT and whichever one you choose to take, or as we saw from so many people last week, a lot of you are looking to take both of these tests, um, which can be a great thing, uh, particularly this year. As you know, COVID uh, coronavirus is up disrupting everything, starting with your day-to-day -day school, but also making this whole college admissions process a little bit more complicated. As we talked about last week, these tests are a great opportunity, both for people who do well, but also some real flexibility if you feel like these things are not the way that you shine most. If ever there has been a time when colleges are gonna be flexible about you as an applicant and you as a student, this will be the year. Meaning that colleges are really going to lean into the things that you already do well. And if for some reason you're great in all ways, but this, this test score is not so much, that's okay. They're gonna put them in context. But also knowing that because the ability to take tests this year is a little bit screwy, for those of you who can really put some time and use this downtime to be well prepared to take tests, it may help you even more this year than it did in years past. So with the time that you're spending with me, the time that you're spending at home, working hard with a tutor or a class or a book or mom and dad or Khan Academy, all of that work is very much worth doing. And as we discussed last week, because there is such an overlap, between the content on the SAT and content on the ACT, the hard work you can do for one will help you for the other. And that's really important, especially this year, when we don't really know what's the next SAT that will run or get canceled, next ACT that will run or get canceled. So while well, usually I mostly encourage people to try to work hard just on the SAT or just on the ACT, this is the year that I'm a little bit more flexible with the students with whom I'm working to say, let's be kind of prepared to do both of these. Because if one test gets zapped because your school isn't open that weekend, we want to be prepared to pivot to take the other test. So with that having been said, I'm going to talk about all the stuff on punctuation that applies really nicely, whether you're taking the ACT, whether you're taking the SAT, or whether you're taking both of them. So here we go. Um, oh, so oh, da, 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 let me jump in here. I forgot I had this piece, which is really important. I was going to talk about just punctuation, but I want to make these three tips about grammar generally. And the first one may strike you as really odd. And you're like, mumble, seriously, this guy is nah. All righty, folks, hi, I realized. I'm a minute behind here because I did not unmute myself, so I apologize. Let me go back to the beginning. So, hi, my name is Ned Johnson. I am the tutor and uh, founder and a tutor geek here at Prep Matters, and we're going to talk about all things punctuation related to the SCT and to the ACT. Uh, the good news is that if ever there was a year when, I, when people want to be well positioned with these tests for both the SAT and the ACT, this is the year. Colleges are going to be super flexible in how they look at you as an applicant. Um, the, the, they're really going to lean into the things that you do well in. So if the SAT or the ACT is not the way that you shine most, you shine more in classroom or on the field or as a leader, as an artist, that's totally, totally cool. They're going to be flexible with how they're trying to evaluate you in this kind of holistic method that colleges look at. But because tests and standardized tests and the whole college admissions is going to be a little wobbly for college admissions people and for you, this is a year when having scores can really, really help you because the ability for everyone to take these tests is a little bit complicated. And I think there are a lot of kids across the country who are not going to are not going to find it that easy to take the test, which means that the scores that you do have can help you even more. So I want you to work as hard as you can knowing 
that your dream school or schools are, will be test score optional, or at the very least will be very flexible in how they evaluate you. But know that the hard work that you're doing on these tests can help you even more this year than in years past. So knowing that school for many of you is really weird and you probably have a whole lot more free time because you're not even getting tested because school's so wackadoodle. Gosh, this is a pretty good time to spend time with me and my colleagues here with Prep Matters Television to get on Khan Academy, to grab a book, to work with a tutor, a mom and dad, a class, whatever you're doing, and work hard. Think of pet test prep as much as you can in a balanced way. It's kind of a eh, kind of a part-time job. Set aside a, a half an hour, two or three or four days a week. Uh, take a practice test. We're going to start doing this. You'll see this coming out on, on our come, come back to our website doing virtual practice tests, virtual practice SETs and ACTs on Saturday morning, kind of like what the real test is gonna be like, because that's gonna be a thing in the future, that we think that ACT and SET are gonna be doing these tests virtually online, just like people who are taking the AP, people who you guys have been on the AP channel, know that your AP exams are gonna be done at home over a computer. And everything that we're hearing is that College Board who make the SAT and ACT, who of course makes the ACT, are gonna be working to try to make these tests available online. So knowing that and knowing that our job is to help you guys to be as prepared as possible, we're starting to put in place uh, things for virtual testing as well. So keep looking over at our website, uh, follow us on Twitter, I'm at Ned Johnson, or at Prep Matters, and you get our updates there about virtual practice tests. So moving on, that having been said, let's talk about all things punctuation. So my hunch is, my hunch is that the majority of you haven't been taught punctuation in a really kind of in intense way that's been really good. But I also think the reality is that very few have, of you have been taught punctuation in an intense way that's very bad. Most people just haven't really learned punctuation that well. We kind of did it for like a week in seventh grade and then uh, went back to the, all the old habits, good or bad, that we ever had. And so the, there's a huge opportunity for all of us to really get clear on the rules of punctuation. Because if it's rule driven, it takes away uncertainty, it takes away unpredictability, it makes you much more confident with the answers that, that you're, the questions that you're doing. So I want you to guys to know these rules as much as possible. I'm going to take you through exactly what I take through every single student with whom I work one on one. And know this, I then go back with my student, students and every single time before they do another section of test, I grill them on all of these rules until they're like, so tired, Steve, Ned, please leave me alone. Stop bothering me about these rules. I want you, just like I want the students I work with every single week, to know these rules as rules because that will help you enormously. If there's any part of the test on the SAT and ACT that I see people make huge jumps on, it's the English on the ACT and the writing on the SAT because so much of what people miss, it's just because of kind of ignorance. You just don't really know. Well, let's learn this stuff together and then make it your job, part-time at least, to really know these rules so you can apply them with all the hard practice that you do. But before we jump into all the punctuation, a few quick tips for taking the English on the ACT or the writing on the SAT. Now, this first rule may strike you as wackadoodle. Mumble, like seriously, won't I get thrown out of the test? Let me explain. Linguists use a term called sub-vocalization. And it looks like, let me find something that's complicated for you. Oh, an ACT. So you get documents. Sometimes you've had this experience. You're reading history, physics, philosophy. You know all the words, but holy smokes, the meaning of them is just a little bit weird. And so we go back and we go, And when you mumble and you move your tongue and your lips, it activates the kind of vocal apparatus and your brain kind of hears it. Why does that matter? Because most of what you know as grammar, as punctuation, you don't really consciously know. So here's an example. Um, have you ever had the experience and you've been listening to someone, uh, maybe eavesdrop in a conversation, it's not that rude, but whatever, who's, non, who's a non-native English speaker? And if you hear the person make a grammatical mistake, you'll go, oh, and I'll say, what? And he's like, well, that was wrong. And I said, well, you're totally right, but why was it wrong? He'll say, because it should be whatever. I said, well, I know, you're totally right, it should be that, but why was that wrong the way he said it? Because it should be whatever. Most of the time, we don't know. 
we know it's right, but as to why it's right or why it's wrong, kind of just because. So for all of you, your first language, and for most of you, I consider it's English, or for many of you, it's English, you heard that language and you learned all the rules and all the subject of agreement and pronouns and all this jazz, and you just say it right because you're surrounded by educated, well-spoken people, your teachers, your parents, your classmates, and so you've just absorbed this stuff. So all that stuff that you kind of intuitively know, how do you access it? By mumbling, by mumbling. So do this under your breath. Don't do it so loud. People around you are like, seriously, dude, can you just, I mean, it's a test. No, no, don't do that but mumble it under your breath. I go and take these tests, which I know is weird, the old guy in the room, because I kind of want to know what I'm talking about and remind myself what it feels like to be you taking the test. So I'm there and I mumble every single time because I have a really good ear for it like you guys. And I don't want you to gotta kind of fight with one arm behind your back. Mumble and do that under your breath, okay? Second thing, read everything. Meaning that there's a long sentence, there's a grammar rule in the middle of it. Don't stop and try to figure out the answer. Keep reading. The end of that sentence can make a huge impact on what we're supposed to have there. Okay. Also, and this happens even more on the ECT than the SAT, you can have a sentence with a question and a sentence and a sentence and a sentence. And then down here, hey, another sentence with a question. Sometimes people get a little bit lazy and they skip from this question, skip over those sentences, and jump to the next sentence, the next question excuse me, the next sentence that has a question in it. So they do the sentence, skip two, three, and four, and jump down to here. Don't do that, okay? We're not really gonna get into this part now because this is mostly about punctuation, but here's the deal. About 10% of the questions on their English, punctuation, grammar, on the writing, are really not writing grammar questions. They're kind of reading comp questions. So you wanna read that stuff because the context matters for transition word, or therefore, but or however, that context matters. Don't skip the stuff. And then you also get these sentences at the very end that ask you, the author's intended purpose was to blah, blah, blah. Did she do it? I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention. <gasps> don't do that. Read it, read everything. And you're not only doing punctuation grammar, but you're reading it for, for comprehension, for understanding, okay? And the last thing is this, simple is good. Not the shortest thing ever, but you want things to be clear and concise. The ACT and the SAT hate redundancy. They hate repetition, that's the bad joke, but whatever. They hate things to be repeated or to be redundant. They want things to be simple and clear. So resist the temptation to have things get more and more flowery and you know decorated and ornate. Again, we're back to redundancy. Have things be simple and clear. Part of this is the people who make the ACT are out of Iowa City, Iowa. The University of Iowa has what's considered one of the country's preeminent programs in writing. And their philosophy is clarity, clarity, clarity. So just keep that in mind. When you ultimately the answer choice that you choose, if it's not clear, it's probably not right. If it's if it's not um, if it doesn't sound good to you, going back to the first one, it probably isn't right. Okay, so those are tips. Mumble, read everything simple is good. Now let's go talk about punctuation. Okay, so what's a colon anyway? Not in biology, because like, ooh, I'm sorry, I have that skewed a little bit to the left. Hopefully you guys can see that better than I can see it on mine, but uh, we'll get that better next time. So a colon. Well, a colon actually has a really simple rule. You all have been taught to do this as a list, sure, but why? An only list? Not so much. If you look at the bottom, actually colons on the test are almost always used for everything except a list because the list is generally the only thing when I, the only thing that I've ever seen students know about a colon is that, oh, you use it for a list. And guess what the test makers know? They know that that's what you know. So they come up with all the weird ways to use colons that are not the weird ways that you're used to using. Oh, I've got a quick question. Um, can you send me info on how to take a virtual practice test? Yeah, we will put that on our website. Uh, we'll be sending some information out about that tomorrow, we'll come back. I'll remind me at that point later. It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, so let me go back to colons. So here's the deal with a colon. It's very simple rule. And again, all of these things, think about them as rules, think about rules, think about rules. We're recording this. You can always go back and see it again. But in a perfect world, make a few notes here for yourselves, a really quick cheat, cheat sheet. And then every time you sit down to do a section of ACT English 
or a, a section of SAT writing, you just go through these rules like, right, 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 right. Like if you played sports, the coaches say, remember these three things, right? And you focus on those before you sit down and take the test. So they're top of mind. And you're making this rule driven, not just taking the test purely based on instinct, okay? So the deal with a colon, ah, uh, but first some terms. A dependent clause versus an independent clause. What the heck is this guy talking about? Really simple. An independent clause is a full and complete sentence. I went to the store. It rained today. It was a beautiful day. We all have COVID. All of those things are complete sentences, okay? She talked on to talk to her friends. She waited for the bus. Independent, dependent clauses are not standalone sentences. While she waited for the bus, while she waited for the bus, what, Ned? Dude, dude finish. Eh. It's not a complete thought. It's not a complete sentence. It just kind of hangs there. It's dependent, waiting for something else, right? Because I was hungry. Because you're hungry, what, Ned? And so I want you to have in your ear that idea that an independent clause is a standalone sentence. I had a great meal. The ice cream was delicious. I fell asleep early. All independent clauses. Because I fell asleep early, although I had a good meal, Dependent clauses. Got me on this? Super important because most of the punctuation that we're going to talk about through this whole thing is really helping us to focus on what's the punctuation, what are the traffic signals, what are the stop signs that are important when we're dealing principally with independent clauses. Okay, so hold on to the independent clause complete sentence. So here we go. The really, really simple rule for colons is this. A colon must be preceded by an independent clause. We're going to have an independent clause, a colon, and then stuff, okay? A sentence, an independent clause, and then explanatory information, okay? That's all I have to have. On a colon, to, before a colon, there must be a complete sentence. So let's look at some examples here. Ned's office is full of tests. That's a standalone sentence. It could stop right there, and we're done. Or Ned's office is full of tests. Okay, fine, I'll explain, and I'll tell you all the tests that are there, right? The shopper only wanted, <laughs> wanted only one thing, and you could stop there, or toilet paper, apparently everybody, I won't even go there, too many bad jokes have already been made about that. It was an excellent day for a picnic. The sentence could stop there. So if you look at all these examples, let me give you a moment just to read through these guys. So first of all, I note that I have a couple mistakes on that I missed, uh, and I'm sure you picked up on this too. Uh, fourth line down, all she wanted was nearby. You can stop the sentence there. She was happy. I should have had a period there, my bad. Um, and then the next one, but watch out for this easy mistake. That also is an independent clause, so I could actually have a colon there. But we're not going to go to the very last sentence. We're going to stop and go, go back up. What you should notice here in all of these things, there's a complete sentence before, a colon, and then sometimes it's a list. Sometimes it's a phrase, right? Single toilet paper. Uh, it's a single thing, uh, more sleep. Sometimes even a complete sentence, right? It was an excellent day for a picnic, colon. The weather was sunny and warm, period. It was an excellent day for a picnic. That is a complete sentence. The weather was sunny and warm. That's a complete sentence. You're like, wait a second, a sentence, a colon and a sentence? Totally. Because the only rule, the only rule is there must be an independent clause, a complete sentence before the colon, and that's it. And after it is just basically any information that explains. Now, the one thing I want you to watch for, the mistake that I had at the very end, let's walk through this together. There are many test optional colleges such as colon, and then I listed a few. We talked about this last week. That is wrong because there are many test optional colleges such as is not an independent clause. It's not a standalone sentence. There are many test optional colleges such as, sort of hangs there and you're like, such as what? I finished that sentence, right? How would that be correct? There are many test optional colleges, colon. That would work. Um, how do you know to use a period or a colon? Oh, what a good question. Thank you for asking that. Here's the deal. Whether you use a period or a colon there, that is a judgment call, okay? And what did I say at the very beginning? We're gonna make all of this stuff rule-driven, 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 because why? The test makers do too. 
they cannot have things be unclear. They cannot have them be ambiguous. There cannot be two right answers. So we will never, 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 never have to make a decision between two things that both work, between a colon and a period. We won't have to do that, okay? All that I need you to know is that to have a colon, com a complete sentence, colon, and then explanatory information thereafter, okay? So we're gonna move on. Next page. Um, the semicolon, half a colon, anyway. Um, the rule is simple. This is probably the easiest thing on all, of all the rules of punctuation. A semicolon is used to join two independent clauses. So a semicolon is basically a period. Sentence, period, sentence, sentence, semicolon, sentence. Independent clause, period, independent clause, independent clause, semicolon, independent clause. That's it, okay? That's it. To use a semicolon, again, repeat that, there must be an independent clause before the semicolon, there must be an independent clause after the semicolon. That's all they have to do. And that's why knowing what an independent clause is is so helpful. So a semicolon is just like a period. There must be a complete sentence before and a complete sentence after. Is that cool? Any questions about those two so far? Okay. So colon and semicolon are pretty clear. The ones that are complicated, we're gonna jump into now, are commas, okay? This is the most important stuff because it's the most tested, and there are three rules about. I got one question popping up really fast. Before I move on, do the two clauses have to be related in order for a semicolon to be used? Um, such a good question. So the purpose, really the purpose of a semicolon is to join two complete sentences that are related. That's the purpose of them. Okay. But I've yet to see a question on either the SAT or the ACT where they use a semicolon with two independent clauses that are not related. Again, the terrific, terrific question that the person who asked it, um, really, really good question, but that's frankly more nuanced than what I think is going to happen on here. Because this, again, this is not the sophisticated writing that some of you may be doing in your classes or AP, English, or whatever it happens to be. I just want to make this rule driven, rule driven, rule driven, because this is not about really nuanced use of punctuation. It's about very rule driven use. So all you have to do is think for colon, sentence, colon, explanatory information, semicolon, sentence, semicolon, sentence. Okay? Um, and so colon has to have, <laughs> keep popping up. Thank you for that question. And we're going to review all this at the end in really quick bullet point form colon, complete sentence colon, information, independent clause, colon, information, semicolon, independent clause, semicolon, independent clause, okay? So I'm gonna move on to commas, which are the most complicated thing. There are three rules for commas. Three rules, that's it. We're gonna make this super rule driven, okay? Here we go. This is it. And I know there's some, some niceties to this that some of you may know, we can lump everything that we know into these three rules. Items in a list. I see again, that's our independent clause or complete sentence. So independent clause, fanboys, independent clause. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then what you can think of as parenthetical information. Information that's nice but not necessary, you can take it out. Note at the bottom, a pause is not a rule, not a rule, not a rule, not a rule. If I've been told, if I get told one more time that I use it for pause, I'm just gonna fall over and die. So not a rule, not a rule, no, 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 no. Okay, here we go. Rule number one, items in the list. Oh yes, but first, pause and make this point over and over. Okay, items in a list. So, oops, oh my gosh, I need to edit better. I was so excited to do this this afternoon, I get carried away writing this. He, he, he ate eggs, toast, and ice cream for breakfast. He didn't add eggs. So if you find more, if anyone's seen more typos as we go through this, please email me, send them on the q and I'll get this perfect by the next time we do this. Uh, so I, any, all your sharp eyes, I really appreciate the help. But yes, that should say, he ate eggs, toast, and ice cream for breakfast, okay? So a list of the three things that he ate. Kelly invited her friends, her family, and her teacher to her graduation, okay? Very typical use, uses of using commas for items in a list. He bought food and drinks, comma, and tinfoil, not okay. He bought food, comma, drinks, comma, and tinfoil, okay? Someone might ask me about a Oxford comma. They will, we won't have to decide between that. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. Um, we're gonna go right on by. So items in a list. Here's another way we can use items in a list. She loved to sing, write songs, and sleep as late as possible. 
There are the three things she likes to do. They are known to take long walks. Oh gosh, more typos. I'm so sorry. They're known to take long walks together, share romantic poetry, and practice social distancing okay, in the romance in the era of COVID. The instructor stopped, dropped, and rolled. Items in the list. Okay? Um, he ate salad, comma, and ice cream. No, 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 no. There'd be no reason for comment there. He ate salad and ice cream. And she apparently ran out of things to say. Uh, aha. Was there another example in there? Um, yep, yeah, okay, great. Um, then rule number two, and this gets used a ton. So again, remember, I see as an independent clause, a complete sentence. If we join an independent clause with a comma, if we join two independent clauses with a comma, we must have fanboys. Okay, so let's look at the sentence that I have here. Let's move this out of my way so I can see this clearly. She loves to sing. He prefers to play the kazoo. Those are two independent clauses, okay? We could use a period there. She loves to sing, period. He prefers to play the kazoo. We could use a semicolon there. She loves to sing, semicolon. He prefers to play the kazoo. The one thing that we cannot do, and this is really important, you may not do an independent clause, a comma, and another independent clause. This is called a comma splice. So a sentence, a comma, and a sentence. Big, 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 big no-no, okay? It sounds fine, but it's not correct. If there are two sentences with a comma, you must, must, must have the fanboys, okay? And probably a lot of you learned this in school. But a quick review. Fanboys are all these short little words, for, and, nor, but, even shorter yet, and then so. Note that these are all these short little words. A lot of times people mistake, make a mistake of sort of sliding into however, because gosh, it means the same thing as but or again. Why can't we use that? It's not one of the rules. It's not a fanboy. I, why? I don't know. I didn't make up the rule. So to say she loves to sing, comma, however, he prefers to play the kazoo is wrong, 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 wrong. You want to watch for that. It has to be a fanboy. If you wanted to use the however, what could we do? We could either have a period or a semicolon. She loves to sing, period. However, comma, he prefers to play the kazoo. That'd be great. You probably have written that yourself. Maybe not a kazoo. Or she loves to sing, comma. Hold on, I lost my train of thought. She loves to sing, semicolon. However, comma, he prefers to play the kazoo. Okay? So when we do two sentences, if it's with a comma, it must be a fan voice. It could be two sentences, like we talked about the previous pages, with a period, or two sentences with a semicolon. But if you're going to join two independent clauses with a comma, there must be a fan voice. So let's go to the next page and look at some more examples, OK? So we're going to look at these. Vanessa loves chocolate. So I've underlined the independent clauses. Vanessa loves chocolate. That's a complete sentence. Ned likes strawberry. That's a complete sentence. Can I join them with a comma? Not only a comma, but if it's comma and yet, which is at the end of our fanboys, that works great, okay? Independent clause, fanboys, independent clause. It was a long day, that's a complete sentence. They were glad it was behind them, that's a complete sentence. You could do that with just a period or a semicolon, but if we have the comma, again, we need the and because it's a fanboys. Does this making sense to folks? Okay, again, if sentences pop up, uh, let me know. Um, they went shopping, they were hungry, two independent clauses, comma and families, okay? And this is something you may already be doing quite a bit, but may not actually have thought about the rule. And again, I want all these things to be rule driven. So if you've got a piece of paper on the side, write these down. First rule of commas, right? We don't talk about commas, no. First rule of commas is for items in a list. Second thing is for two independent clauses with a fanboy. Okay, and then we're, oh, we'll do the incorrect before I go on to the third one. She, he slept late and had breakfast at noon. We do not want a comma there. We don't want a comma there because we don't have a complete sentence after the, after the comma. We should just write, he slept late and had breakfast at noon. There's no rule, no reason to have a comma there, okay? And note also again, she's a great student. However, she is sometimes, that is what we'd want to write sometimes, sometimes bored in class. We do not have um, a fanboys. We have a however, which means the exact same thing as but, but the grammar police said, nope, nope, not let's use it. It's gotta be a fanboys, okay? All right, next page. Third rule, third and final comma rule, parenthetical information. So information that's nice, but not necessary. Let me just let you read through this. 
let me let you guys read through this for a moment, and then and I'll um, sort of point some of this stuff out. Yeah, that should be lead all scores. I am just horrified. Sorry, guys. Again, if you find mistakes, send them my way. I guess I'm keeping it real. Mayor of COVID. Have your teachers been making mistakes online, by the way? I'm curious if they if they get uh, uh, if they're less sure-footed online than they are uh, in person. Okay, so you see here at the bottom, you can have this information at the start of the sentence um, while waiting for her friends. Starts it. She checked her phone. The main independent clause is she checked her phone, right? You can have the information at the end of the sentence. You can also have the beginning of the sentence. All three things are possible. Info, subject, and the verb, meaning the independent clause. Subject, then the info, then the verb, or subject, verb, and then info at the end. Does that make sense? So, um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Um, I want to point out, by the way, he has a cool mom, comma, a surfing instructor and a math teacher, meaning that his mom is cool. She's a surfing instructor and a math teacher. Love that. If we had that, he has a cool mom, comma, a surfing instructor, comma, and a math teacher, these are the three things that she has. When there's a, only the comma after mom, all that parenthetical information, parenthetical information that comes after is describing his cool mom. He has a cool mom, stuff about her. Does that make sense? Or we can think about it this way. You could have done that, put that before. A surfing instructor and a math teacher comma, his mom is really cool. You could do it that way too, all right? So again, commas, three rules, items in a list, two independent clauses with a coordinating conjunction, and parenthetical information. So again, we're gonna remove all the stuff at the end, but we're gonna now go on to the last thing in punctuation that we really get to tangle with, which is dashes. Okay, I'll let you read through this for just a moment because you can read as well as I can read it to you. I'm checking a note from my producer, give me one moment. Okay, so dashes, which most people probably don't use very much, and actually it's funny for me, <laughs> I always laugh about Sunday quotes because I could probably write like 300 pages of text, right, or write a book or something, and never feel the need to use a semicolon. Yet strangely, it seems to be like every seventh question on the ACT or ACT, and, and the same is true for dashes. Many of you probably don't use them at ever, you know, ever at all. Um, yet they show up on these tests. Um, and again, the reason for this is that the test makers only want and only want to test things where there's a rule. And there are only so many rules. So they're going to really sort of use all the ones that are uh, available to them. They also probably know that they can, because they want people to get a lot of questions right, but some of them wrong when they throw things at us that are a little bit curveball-y, predictably some people will get them wrong. And let, let's let that be other people, not you guys, since you now know these rules. Um, someone asked, by the way, where is this going to show up? All of the things, all of these um, presentations, mine and all the ones about the ACT and SAT and my colleagues who are talking about all the stuff for college admissions, writing your essay and college questions, all of these things are recorded. So you can follow the link and go right back to our website. You can go to prepmatters.com uh, and you kind of scroll down. We call it PMTV. You can follow us on Twitter. All of these things usually pop up two, three days later. So you can go back and, and listen to all of this if you want to relive the glory of me uh, talking about punctuation. Or you can go and just look at the piece that you want. You can share this with your friends. Do whatever you want. Our interest in, in doing this is just to help you guys as much as we can because we know things are so disrupted um, with all, with well, everything's disrupted, right? Um, but again, the, the interesting thing for me about dashes and semicolons is that these do show up on the test quite a bit, even though in the real world, most of us probably don't use them that much. But I want this to be rule-driven, rule-driven, rule-driven. Again, you can follow this at the end. We'll, we'll have a summation at the end. Or again, keep, keep taking notes as you go through this so you can look at your own notes. So right before you sit down and do 15 questions at the ACT, let you go, okay, I've got the rules. Let me reread those one more time. I'm ready. And then jump in and do it. Okay? So note that here, by the way, then, dash is dash, which act like commas, comma, usually come in pairs. You can use two commas, you can use two dashes, you can use two parentheses, but you can't do one of each. That's not going to be, they just, they, you can't, you, they got to be in pairs. You can't do one of each, okay? Um, and sometimes the test makers try to slide that by you, so don't fall for it. Um, and here's the interesting thing. 
For years, it had always been the double dash, double dash, double dash. And just recently, test makers have worked in the single dash. So I'll let you read this for just a second. Pretty straightforward. And at the bottom, a pause is still not a reason for a cause or a cause. Chip and comma, I keep pointing out my mistakes. It's so exciting. A pause is not a reason to use a comma. I am going to try to fix these things before I post it, but we'll see what happens. So let's do a quick review, going right through all the things we've talked about. And then whatever questions you have, we'll jump into those at the end. OK? So here we go. Colon. Again, independent clause is a complete sentence. So independent clause, colon, information. That's it. Semicolon. Independent clause, semicolon, independent clause. Really straightforward, okay? Commas, items in a list. To, do, to join two independent clauses with a comma and a fem, which again, if you have a sentence, a common sentence, big no-no. Sentence and a comma must have the fem voice and then the independent clause. And then the third reason is parenthetical information, okay? And then dashes, which can be in pairs or in singly, or singly, use singly, act like commas to set off information. And as I said, keep mumbling. So I'm going to look at questions really fast and then post them if you got them. And then a quick um, advice for some homework for you guys. Um, when you use, uh, is it still, when you use and a list, is it still necessary to use a comma? Such a good question, right? So he likes chocolate and vanilla. No, you wouldn't have that for two things. Um, there's, um, so you would never use a comma if you just have two things. If you have three things, um, Technically, you could he loves chocolate and vanilla and strawberry, but that the, at this point is not considered standard English. He loves chocolate, comma, strawberry, comma, and vanilla. Sometimes, then this is why I think the question you're getting to, he loves chocolate, comma, strawberry, and vanilla. Do you, and the question is, do you have to have a comma between those last two things on the list? This is what's called an Oxford comma. Some uh, newspapers use it, some people don't. That will never, 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 never be tested because, again, the test makers are only going to test things where there is absolute consistency, absolute agreement among all the grammar experts in the world about what the rule is. So the question is, if you have three items in a list, do you have to have commas between, you know, after this, between the first and second and the second and the third? I'm not even going to, I don't, I should not have answered this at all, I suppose, but don't worry about that. They will never, 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 never test that because both ways are correct, both on these tests and for your own writing. So that will never be something that's tested. Only thing you have to know is if there are three items in a the list, there must be a common, must, you, you, must, you can't do chocolate and vanilla and strawberry. That's not considered standard in English any longer. Um, so whenever you use a sub subjugating conjunction, we have to actually use Two commas. Vanessa loves chocolate, comma. However, oh, so really good question. Um, Vanessa loves chocolate, comma. However, Ned loves like strawberry. Then if you guys can write this down. Vanessa loves chocolate, comma. However, Ned likes strawberry. That is not going to be correct. That should be Vanessa loves chocolate, semicolon. However, comma. Ned likes strawberries, strawberry. Or that could be a period, um, because that would still be considered. Um, it would still be con considered a comma spliced, and they just don't like it. Um, all right, so you might be interested, how can I practice this stuff? Well, we've put together about 50 questions of these, you know, kind of 10 of each type, of just colons, of just semicolons, of all the rules of commas, then of dashes. So I guess that probably gets to 60 questions. Uh, and we have this as a document. I think it's online already. So you can slide right over there. Uh, I think we'll send this out as an email as well to everyone who's uh, been attending. It has answers for every single question, so you can do that practice. How to then put this into practice, we talked about this last week. Um, reminder that Khan Academy on its website has 10 practice SATs. You can put all the stuff into practice over there. Um, for the ACT, ACT does not have practice tests available online, but I love the official guide from the ACT. It's a pretty good 15, 18 bucks, whatever it is on Amazon, which is still delivering, thank goodness. Um, it's a really good um, resource to have in part because in their workbook, they have a really clear explanation for every single question on there. So that's a really good thing. If you just want the practice test, my advice, just Google practice ACT, ACT PDF. They're kind of all over the internet. 
um, and you can just print one out or you can do it online. Um, go over to the ACT website. They have some work they're doing with some folks over there that's pretty good too. I uh, always want to point you in the direction of all the great directions that people want to help uh, as you guys are trying to be as prepared as you can be for these tests. But again, from our end, I've got 60 of these questions. They should be outlined right now. Um, and we will send this as an email out to you guys. And then next week, I think we're diving into a bunch of nerdy math stuff. Um, so I look forward for that. Let me see if there are any, oh, we have more questions. I love your guys' question. Um, do, do, do. Oh, give me one moment to read. If two clauses are separated by comma and fanboys, but neither of the clauses are independent, is the comma wrong? Yeah, we're baiting, yeah, we wouldn't use it there. We wouldn't use it there. Um, and the recordings, the recordings are usually showing up about three days afterwards. It depends how long it takes them to, uh, what's in the queue, how many things to try to edit and get them going. Um, uh, are parentheses and dashes interchangeable? For the purpose of this test, yes. Um, there may be some, and some of you may know really kind of nerdy, um, you know, nuances of these, but the test makers are really testing basically what we've done that goes right down the middle. Um, the only other thing I didn't talk about was were apostrophes, um, which are used sometimes for possession uh, and sometimes for contraction. Um, so that, you know, the easiest thing, Ned's uh, car uh, is really fast. So Ned apostrophe, so the possession Ned's car is really fast or Ned's really fast. So that is Ned is really fast. Um, the one rule on there, and I can just, send this as an addendum or we can talk about this next week to be really clear on the difference between uh, actually let me grab a pen I'll do it this way I'll write upside down for you guys you can see this okay so here we go so hopefully you guys can see this okay so ITS IT apostrophe ITS apostrophe First and most important thing to know, that is not a word. <laughs> ITS apostrophe is just simply not, not, not a word, okay? So ITS apostrophe, this is a contraction for it is. And then this is possessive. ITS apostrophe is possessive. So to make a sentence, it's too bad that this team had its um, games canceled, okay? It's too bad, IT apostrophe, it's too bad. The team had its, the games of the team, canceled. So possessive, contraction. It is possessive, okay? Um, and that's the only, the last thing that will really be on this. 90 plus percent of the stuff is commas, semicolons, and colons, and then the occasional dash that's in here. So this should get you through pretty much everything that's on the test. Now, if you guys are going through, um, and have, hold on, I'm reading a couple more questions that popped up. Um, um, so the recording on here, I saw a question about a semicolon in a sentence. Um, semicolon in a sentence. Um, I've had a great time talking about punctuation, semicolon. Punctuation is an important part of the SAT and ACT, okay? So these, uh, all these things are gonna be on the website. If you go to prepmatters.com and you scroll, and our first page is the COVID page, you scroll down, you see all the stuff about the classes. You go to my link for the SCT, ACT, and the practice questions should be on there. The recordings of all these things will also be on there. They're gonna edit it out, you know, clean up some of the stuff I've been talking about at the end. Um, and those things, all the recordings from the AP Calc and the AP US History and the College of Missions and last week SCT, versus the ACT, all of these recordings are there on our website. We're also putting this out on our, on, by Twitter. Um, if you have specific questions, if you have suggestions of things, you can tweet them at me, you can tweet them at Prep Matters. My email is online, it's Ned Johnson at Prep Matters. Again, my only job is to be here and help you guys out as much as, you, as I can. I don't really know who you are because most of you guys are anonymous and even the names I don't really know is, you know, Martha's iPad. Hi, Martha. Um, Whatever I can do to help, you know, please give me feedback, give me suggestions, make requests. Our interest is helping you guys as much as we possibly can. I know it's a hard time to be a student. I know it's a hard time to be everything, but you guys clearly have your sights set on doing well in school and well on these tests and well in the process of applying to college. And it's my interest in just to help you as much as I can. So please uh, um, send questions along the way. Thanks again for joining me. I look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. Uh, stay well and, and try to stay as connected with your friends as you can. Have a great day.